Well, thank you all for being here, and thank you, Dan Okrent, for being here. I'm Bill Goldstein, and until about three weeks ago, I was the programming curator here. Um, obviously, I left on good terms because. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's why they asked me to introduce. Um, no, uh, you are the um, peak of my career here, and <laughs> and they knew that I could never top this, so uh, they were were asking me to go. Uh, so uh, thank you for being here. I just want to say how happy I am, one, to have worked at Roosevelt House for so long, but also to have the chance to talk to Dan, who I've, I've known uh, for a while and uh, with whom I overlapped at the New York Times, at least in some fashion. Um, but before we get to the conversation, oh, are you, I don't know how much more loudly I can speak. Is, is, are people not hearing this? Um, that uh, Roosevelt House, as you know, uh, or as many of you may know, was the home of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, um, built for them as a wedding present by Sarah Delano Roosevelt. And uh, one of the uh, interesting things about this book is the way in which some of the themes of bigotry, eugenics, and the law that kept two generations of Jews, Italians, and other European immigrants out of America intersects with uh, various Roosevelt uh, stories. Uh, we will touch on that. Uh, but the, the theme of the book and the the, the historical research that goes into it, as well as the excellence with which it is written, make it uh, a very exciting evening for me as a curator and also as a moderator. Uh, so uh, without further history of Roosevelt House, I guess we'll get into the history of the guarded gate. Thank you, Dan Okren, Thank for you. being here. Let's do it. So... Um, <laughs> So let's talk a bit about eugenics and what it is, what it was, and also what drew you to this subject, having written about Prohibition and then Rockefeller Center, um, or I forget the order, actually, the other way around. Uh, how did you become interested in this subject, which has long roots in American history? Um, I think that I got interested in eugenics because somebody brought it up at a dinner party. Uh, she grew up in Cold Spring Harbor. This is uh, Christy Macy, who's married to the historian Taylor Branch. Mm -hmm. um, and she was talking about how this uh, eugenic uh, cult had developed in the city, the town that she had grown up in. It was much, mostly gone by the time that Christy grew up in the post-war post years. But just her saying the word eugenics, uh, just her, eugenics, geez. I remember something about that. I don't know whether I remember it from biology class or from the playground, but I knew that it wasn't good and I wanted to look into it a bit. And then I discovered the immigration angle, uh, and that's what really excited me. Uh, the immigration story, um, it kind of connects to the prohibition story. Uh, prohibition was used as a weapon against immigrants from Europe the same way that uh, eugenics was used as a weapon. Uh, just background on eugenics, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with its, with its origins, it really comes right out of the Darwinian revolution uh, of the middle 19th century. In 1859, <clears throat> when Darwin publishes Origin of the Species, uh, until then, the only theory of the origin of mankind was the Adam and Eve theory of mankind. Uh, mm -hmm. That said, we're all related to each other. Once Darwin established that we are not all related to each other, that invites in such things as racial distinction, uh, feelings of racial superiority, racial hatred at all. I mean, not that it didn't exist before, but this gave it kind of a scientific credence. There was also that whole tumult around uh, in, this, in the social sciences and the natural sciences launched by, by Darwin. Long comes in 1869, his cousin, Francis Galton, one of his many cousins, they weren't close, but Galton was a very wealthy uh, British uh, gentleman scientist who engaged in any number of, of explorations uh, in, in the sciences, some of them very important. He's the man who discovered that fingerprints were forms of, of identification. He, as a statistician, was the first one to write about the regression toward the mean. He uh, really did some important things, and then he did one really horrible thing, which is he launched this idea of eugenics. 
when he did in the late 19th century, Galton largely saw it as a positive way to improve a population. And in fact, at one point, he recommends that uh, Britain find 5,000 genetically, the word gen genetics didn't exist then, but we'll use it, uh, the 5,000 best young men and the 5,000 best young women match them up with each other uh, in the state arranged marriages, have all 5,000 couples married in Westminster Abbey with Queen Victoria presiding, and then when they leave, they're all given a lifelong stipend, or at least a stipend that lasts through their reproductive years, so they don't have to work, they can get busy making better Britons. Um, so, fundamentally positive. Uh, nutty, but positive. It leaps across the ocean around 1900, the same time that the lost paper of Gregor Mendel is discovered, where uh, the genetics finally has some science, real science behind it. And it's a distortion of that science welded to Galton's ideas that, that forms the, the 20th century version of eugenics. And it is not terribly long before the, the opposite of what Galton had been talking about is, becomes an area of pursuit, negative eugenics. We need to keep the inferior from reproducing because they are spoiling the bloodstream and if we can keep them from reproducing, we will have a better nation going forward. And all, all of the evils come out of the box from that moment. And what I think is important is it's not only a shift, as you document it, not only a shift in sort of aspect or perspective, but it is almost like a snowball with all of these people doing more and more, quote, Research, I think, I think you use the phrase even something like research, if one must call it that. I mean, that, that goes into this. It's not just Galton's idea somehow is sitting there for a little while until it's picked up again. No, and, and there's, if I may borrow this handsome book there, there's a quotation that I use as, as an epigraph from William Bateson, who's the man who actually came up with the word gene and genetics. And in 1905, this is post-Galton, but before it's really become popular in America. He says, when power is discovered, man always turns to it. The science of heredity will soon provide power on a stupendous scale, and in some country at some time, not perhaps far distant, that power will be applied to control the composition of a nation. And that's exactly what happened, which is to say that the people who embraced eugenics were the ones who had another agenda about controlling the composition of, of, of the nation. Uh, and it became clearest in the immigration story. The use, the adaptation of eugenics, bogus science, to sell something that they believed in. Uh, the science came after the, the feeling. And then before we go forward from Galton, I'd like to go back a little into American history because you show that these ideas which came from this British, quote, scientist. I mean, one of the things you do that's so wonderful is, is you say at first that you're, you'd like to have the word science, in this case, in quotation marks, but obviously you would have had to do it. Like I a, would have run out of quotation marks. Uh, yeah. so, so whenever we use that, yeah. that word, science, it's air quotes. It's, it's yeah. air quotes. Um, but you make it very clear that these ideas intersected not only with an entire cast of, cast, C-A-S-T-E, of, uh, of Brahmins in Boston. I mean, a long history of that. But then also with a rush in America, even before the revolution, to keep others out. I mean, right. so uh, that it's it, not just it, it, invented in the 19th or 20th centuries. It's a perfect sine wave, uh, America's engagement with, Im with immigrants. Uh, uh, at one moment, it's uh, come to the golden door, give us your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, and the next moment, it's keep out and stay out. And it begins, uh, I think you're referring to Benjamin Franklin yes. in 1753, writing about how the Germans who were coming into the Pennsylvania colony were ruining the culture and the language, uh, and in very, very unseemly language uh, that, that, that he's using for it. Uh, then we go through a period of, of openness to immigration uh, because the country is building. We need people to build the country. Um, you know, Lincoln, in fact, uh, uh, enacted a law in 1864 uh, to enable more people to come from Europe to, with government support. 
Uh, along the way, there are these blips. The Irish were a blip, um, but that you know worked out over time. And then, what happens is in the 1880s, when the uh, the mass immigration from Eastern and Southern Europe begins. First, Southern Europe around 1880. Then, from uh, Rus the Russian Empire and uh, adjacent countries around 1890, uh, suddenly there's a, a, a perceived crisis by those who had not been paying attention at all, because these people didn't exist. There's a passage in Edward Bellamy's Looking Backward, in which he is at a, the, the character is at a party on Commonwealth Avenue in Boston, having just come from the slums of the South End, less than a mile away, and he said, do they, do they, I'm not gonna say it exactly the way that Bellamy did, but uh, were they not aware that these people even existed, that they were there? And no, they were not there until there were so, mon so many they couldn't resist it. And that that's, comes, Henry, can I? Yes, I was going to so, say that. I was going to. You know, the, 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 the embodiment of that is, is, is Henry Adams, uh, who in his great, great book, The Education of Henry Adams, uh, he describes walking across Boston Common and encountering uh, a, a, a furtive Isak or Jacob reeking of the ghetto and speaking a strange guttural Yiddish. And it's as if he has seen a Martian. And it's right there in his city. It's in the hub of the universe. And he's horrified by it. And that embodies, as I said, uh, the feeling that overcame people who were far better and more open-minded than Henry Adams. Well, and one of the things that happens is that this group of, or this strain in American culture, because it's also, as you show in the 19th century, takes different form on the West Coast and then in right. Washington law, you know, related to Chinese immigrants, uh, that, that this intersects with politics. I mean, it's not only false science, but a political opportunity for someone like Henry Cabot Lodge, I mean, and... Yeah, Henry Cabot Lodge is the political father of the immigration movement that eventually culminates, really right before his death, uh, culminates in 1924. But in 1895, he introduces the first uh, uh, immigration restriction law that was not aimed at people who were a different color. Uh, there had been, the, the Chinese Restriction Act had been in effect since 1882. Um, but this time it was aimed at Europeans. Uh, and he says very clearly in the debate, his, the means that he wishes to use is a literacy test, knowing that people coming from southern Italy and from the Russian Empire are not likely to be literate. And he says it very clearly that if we use this as a filter, we will keep out the ones from Russia and from Poland and from Armenia and from Greece and from Italy. It was very clearly aimed at populations that he and his allies wish to keep away. This is the same Henry Cabot Lodge, who at the same time is the leading voice in the US Senate for black voting rights. Uh, and these, these uh, kind of uh, uh, disconnects occur throughout the story. Well, th that's one of the things I wanted to have you talk about, is the way in which these are not only retrograde people who are taking up these policies or ideas. I mean, that, that they intersect with progressivism in very, much very so. disturbing ways. Uh, one of my, I would say, favorite characters, but I'd better say most interesting characters, <laughs> is a man named Joseph Lee, who was known as the first citizen of Boston. Very, very wealthy family, uh, pure Brahmin. Uh, he considered himself a socialist. His hero was Tolstoy. He went to see Tolstoy as a young man, sat at his knee, drank kvass with him. Uh, he devoted his entire life to... to charitable endeavors. He supported uh, the Cowaliga Training School for, for uh, freed blacks in Alabama, uh, black churches in Boston, the Women's League for International, International League for Peace and Freedom. Um, the, he founded the Massachusetts Civic League. He was the chairman of the Boston School Committee and made certain that the school stayed open at night for the immigrants to learn English, and he brought doctors and dentists and, into the schools. And then he was at the same time single-handedly financing the anti-immigration movement. And in his private correspondence, uh, one letter to a friend is, soon Europe will be drained of all of its Jews, maybe to its benefit, but not to ours. And in another letter, he says the reason why he's so engaged by uh, the, uh, in, engaged in the anti-immigration movement is his fear of the US becoming a Dago nation. And this was an incredibly cultivated man whose instincts, by and large, we would all applaud today but this, there was this fire burning underneath 
these people that couldn't be stopped. Well, how much of the their actual words, I mean, in words like that, did you know going into the story? I mean, you had the idea that this science had intersected with politics in the early 20th century and that it was related to the to the you know American effort of purification that went along with prohibition but were you shocked to discover this that there was more to the story than you Yes knew? I was I, mean, I knew none of it uh, that's why you write books right <laughs> uh, you get somebody to pay you to find out things that you don't know uh, the the uh, um, the, the constant discovery of people I had already admired or would th thought that I would admire if I had, had known about them before, like Lee, uh, it, it, it goes throughout the story. Um, and and it's, it's discouraging. You, know, you, want, you want the good guys to be good guys in all things, and of course they're not. So the, 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 the alliance that was made between the progressives uh, who were pro-immigration um, restriction and the conservatives was a very odd one. And it even stretched across in, in different uh, directions in terms of alliances. The only uh, people, I think, in the U.S. who were more anti-immigrant than the Boston Brahmins and the New York aristocrats, who are the prime movers in this book, uh, was the labor movement, uh, particularly Samuel Gompers, the president of the AFL, himself an English-Jewish uh, immigrant who says in his memoir in 1924 that on this is the only time in his life he ever agreed with Henry Cabot Lodge, whom he despised uh, for everything else that Lodge believed in. Lodge was pure patrician and, and, and uh, aristocrat oligarch. Um, but it brought these people together in common cause. And the language they use uh, is, is terribly freighted with the, the language of, of, uh, of ethnic hatred. They call them races in those days. There was the Italian race, the Greek race, so on and so forth. Uh, another way of distinguishing them from you know, the, the, the person who's doing the speaking. Um, and I've lost the train of my thoughts, so you better get it back <laughs> well, on just, track. <laughs> just what, what you knew and didn't know. I mean, when, I knew when, very little. I knew very little. I, uh, you know, I knew I hated Henry Cabot Lodge because he started the Spanish-American War and killed the League of Nations, and I didn't know anything else about him. Uh, I later learned that my favorite lo Lodgeism is uh, the fact about Lodge. He was Teddy Roosevelt's best friend, and uh, after Roosevelt's death, he published the, their collected correspondence, taking out every racist thing that either of them ever said, totally bowdlerizing it. This is a man who was the, the first PhD in political science at Harvard, a uh, really disgraceful uh, <laughs> performance. Uh, so uh, before we get to Teddy Roosevelt, um, you not only have uh, you know, Samuel Gompers in there, but you know, even W.E.B. Du Bois is not quoted to you know, an effect that would enhance his reputation. Uh, well, if, if you think about Du Bois, his, his, his position on the elevation of the Negro, to use the term of the time, in American life was the talented tenth. The idea of the talented tenth will lead their people uh, into a, you know, a greater role in American life, the role that they deserved. Um, that on its, on its face is, is uh, it's very anti-democratic. Uh, and in 1916, in his, the NAACP magazine, The Crisis, which he uh, founded and edited, uh, he talks about, uh, he searches for eugenic families, eugenically superior families that need to lead our people forward. Uh, it, could, it was a wonderful thing. It could serve anybody's purposes. And there, you know, there are Jewish eugenicists, and there are Italian eugenicists, and they're all, they all want their piece of this very unappealing pie. And so then how, I mean, you, you make this come alive in the book. I mean, if you can give us a sense of the politicization of this um, by Lodge and others, and then how it plays out in the early 20th century in Congress, I mean, with yeah. various presidents, including Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah. Uh, the 1895 law that, that Lodge introduces passes Congress in 1896 uh, with very healthy margins, uh, certainly in the House of Representatives by an enormous margin. And then on the very last day of his presidency, his second, his non-consecutive term, Grover Cleveland vetoes it. And he says that this is just an excuse for exclusion. Duh. And the, the, it is, this is the one thing that I think that Lodge and, and, and Cleveland agreed about. Lodge knew it was exclusion, but he thought that was a good thing. And, and uh, um, Cleveland, who was pretty close with a lot of the robber barons and the, the timber magnates, you know, they needed cheap labor, so you know, he, he, he maybe didn't have the best motives, but he vetoed it. Uh, Lodge reintroduces it every two years, or his allies reintroduce it. 
and it gets, passes one house, it passes the other house, and then in 1912 it passes again. And this time, William Howard Taft, in the last month of his tenure, he, it's, it's, they, you know, they, they veto it and then get out of town fast. I think that was part of it. Um, and then, shockingly, given what else we know about him, Woodrow Wilson vetoes it twice. Uh, and one time there were enough votes to override the veto, and uh, he really, you know, he, he gave away a lot of judgeships and postmasterships to be able to get the, to, to get the veto to be sustained. Uh, it's not until 1917, and there's an intervening event that we'll get to, uh, that the Literacy Act is finally um, passed again by Congress, vetoed again by Wilson, and then it's overridden. So it's put into place. But uh, up till then, in the years that have passed since it first came about, Eastern and Southern Europe have been educated. And there are letters among the members of the Immigration Restriction League saying, this doesn't work anymore. Right. These people are educated. They're going to pass the literacy test. One guy says, well, they're better now because of it. But then he moves on to, what else can we do to keep them out? So Madison Grant, is it mm -hmm. time for Yes, him? I mean, there are just some, you know, we don't have time to get through all of the we people. Don't have time who, for Madison who, Grant. But, no, uh, we, but he's, he's really something. Madison Grant. Yeah. Uh, uh, is not terribly well known. How many people here have heard of Madison Grant? So, you know, a, a decent handful. Uh, well, my family, of course. They, <laughs> they've, read, <laughs> they've been listening to me talk about him forever. I've um, heard of Madison and Grant, <laughs> I mean, but... Uh. <laughs> right. uh, uh, Madison Grant was a very wealthy uh, New Yorker, an aristocrat uh, of, 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 of the finest uh, quality uh, on both sides of his family. Um, he was the founder of the Bronx Zoo. He was the chairman of the American Museum of Natural History for many years. He s almost single-handedly saved the redwood forests of Northern California. There's a forest named after him, and there's a plaque honoring him there. He was known That'll be coming down <laughs> as soon as your book gets to the West <laughs> Coast. Uh, 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 oh, there are so many plaques to be coming down <laughs> if they read this book. Um, he was known as America's leading conservationist. He really did great things for conservation. He wanted to conserve two things. There was a consistency. He wanted to conserve the American landscape and the American bloodstream. Uh, that was his language uh, that he used. And he saw, he was a, he was not, he, he was something of a political reformer. He supported reform candidates in New York, but he was not uh, a progressive or a socialist. He was a very, very conservative person. Um, his racism was undisguised when he was up for membership in the Century Club. Uh, we're not allowed to talk about it here, right? Uh, <coughs> in the secret Century Club. When he was up for, for uh, one of his sponsors wrote, um, Mr. Grant is well known for certain attitudes about certain peoples, but if you can get past that, he's good company. Uh, and, and he was. He was clearly a very charming guy in many ways, but uh, uh, loathsome in, in, in the, the key ways. And he writes a book in 1916 called The Passing of the Great Race that brings together the anti-immigration uh, movement and the eugenics movement. And what he does is he takes the basic negative eugenics idea that there are bad people that are inferior, that you know, they, don't, they don't have the proper genetic quality, uh, and he applies it to national groups uh, without any evidence without anything resembling science, without any degree that would qualify him to do this, but with a gift for, for prose uh, and for invention. And it's a very impressive book if you're impressed by the names of, of long extinct peoples in Estonia that he you know, cites what, everything he knows about them, how he knows them, we don't know. And he s says, and this is really picking up a line that Lodge used in debate in 1895, that it's known, it is known that if you mix two racial groups, the progeny of the two groups will revert to the lower group. <laughs> this was virtually accepted science. I mean, Lodge got away with saying it, he gets away with saying it, and he expresses it in the middle of this astonishing book. You can't believe it, it, it kind of explodes in your face as you're reading it. Um, there are three European races, primary European races. The Nordics, who are tall and blonde and noble and generous and leaders. The Alpines, who are okay, a little bit shorter and you know, not so imaginative. And then the lowly Mediterraneans, who are small and dark. And you know, yeah, they got a little bit of artistic ability, but who cares about that? <laughs> uh, he, sa he says these things. And, and uh, he says that knowing that the, the, uh, the, inter uh, the mating of any two groups will revert to the lowest. That the marriage between 
a Nordic and, a, and an Alpine will produce an Alpine. And the marriage between an Alpine and a Mediterranean will produce a Mediterranean. And the marriage between any of the three European races and a Jew yields a Jew. And this is really the central thought uh, of, of, of his piece. And uh, it's published by, interestingly, Scribner, my publisher. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, different cast of characters, different ownership, but the same name on the door. And uh, it, it is not, it's not a huge commercial success, but it is picked up immediately by those who felt, realized that the literacy test was not sufficient to keep these people out. And this idea of racial eugenics uh, becomes the, the, the flavor of the, of, of the day, uh, culminating, and we will go back, but we'll, it culminates in 1921. Calvin Coolidge writes an article in Good Housekeeping. Uh, <laughs> that says uh, that now that biological laws, those are the two words, have proven that these people are inferior, we have to keep them out of the country. And that it's, from the, it's not that that was the statement that m moved everybody, but the fact that the incoming vice president could say this with impunity in, a popu in the popular press gives an idea of how thoroughly those ideas had saturated the culture in a very few short five years. Well, you make it very clear that these ideas, I mean, whether it's the Boston uh, group of, of people and then Madison Grant and other New Yorkers uh, are, uh, you know, a, a certain kinds of coteries that, 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 and then Scribner, the institutions of American life support this idea even though the basic idea of you know the statue of liberty or something which mm. is also of this period you know give me your tired you're poor uh, and you it's important to remember that lazarus writes that before the big immigration yeah. that's 1883 uh and in 1893 i don't think she would have gotten away with it i genuinely believe that well i mean just as an aside to show that as dark as this is there's quite a bit of delight in it i mean even if it's horrific delight um, that that her poem is replied to uh, by a poem and then there are other poems on this that seem to you know, <laughs> sway the, the day. The, yeah, this was an day. era when we fought our politics through verse. Yes, <laughs> I mean it's so bizarre. Yeah, I mean yeah. tell us a little bit about that and then we'll come back to the Well you told about stuff. it. I mean I don't have a lot to add. Oh to you don't want to read I the poems? Uh, I, to, <laughs> I think you could find them for me. Um, you know, it's mostly it's not the quality of Lazarus's work. Uh, although, you know, kind of stirring. Thomas Bailey Aldrich, the, the Boston editor, uh, writes a <clears throat> poem called Unguarded Gates, uh, and he writes about liberty, oh, liberty, white goddess. That's the statue. You know, what can you do? What, what do we do about this problem that we have? So, uh, and there's a wonderful labor poem in there yeah, that, that, that uh, defeats one of the bills at, at a certain yeah. point. But so the institutions of American life really are working together to support this idea and to, to, to bring it into the White uh, House, basically. Eugenics is taught in every university in the country uh, to varying degrees of, uh, of, with varying degrees of passion, sometimes in science departments, sometimes in education schools, sometimes in theology departments, uh, but it is absolutely everywhere. Uh, there are basic textbooks. One of the textbooks that puts forth the eugenic theology um, is, is called A Civic Biology, uh, written by a man who was uh, a, a head of the science department at DeWitt Clinton High School, mm -hmm. I believe. And that's the book that John Scopes taught from in, the, at the, in, in Dayton, Tennessee, that led to the Scopes monkey trial. This was modern science. Scopes was perceived by Henry Fairfield Osborne, the, the, for 25 years, the director of the American Museum of Natural History. He says, he's one of my grandsons because he, he's taking modern science forward. Uh, Osborne was worse than Grant. He was Grant's best friend. I say he was worse than Grant because he controlled the American Museum of Natural History. Whatever we feel about it today, man, it's got a really bad past. It, it was the, the beating heart, really, of the, uh, of the eugenic movement, and it, it, it has its fullest expression in 1921, the Second International Congress of Eugenics, where Osborne brings in scholars, scholars, from all over the world uh, to sell the idea of racial eugenics. I mean, it was their coming out party. It was, I was going to say it was their bar mitzvah, but that would be inappropriate under the context. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, uh, so the Museum of Natural History, the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories, uh, Princeton, 
uh, as an institution, Stanford as an institution, and then pockets at virtually every other major university. Uh, well, before we, we get to that, I mean, there's so many things I want to talk about, but the, in New York, I mean, you've talked about Madison Grant, and you mentioned that the way into this book for you was uh, your friend who uh, talked about Cold Spring Harbor, um, and the, the birth of that institution really was right near here on 69th and 5th, and if you could tell us about the Red Letter Day Oh. for humanity that, that occurred there. Um, and Well, Charles B. Davenport, who was a legitimate, genuinely important scientist, a zoologist, uh, who becomes the Galton of American eugenics, he is set up at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, financed by the Carnegie Institution of, Wa of Washington, doing genetic research. This is a station for experimental evolution, doing genetic research with plants, animals, insects. Uh, and then he gets excited by this idea. He is just absolutely, uh, he's taken away by it, and he has to start an institution. He needs to raise the modern equivalent of, I think, $30 million to do it. And he goes over to the corner of 69th, and he didn't just show up out of the blue, but it was the home of Mrs. E.H. Harriman, the widow of E.H. Uh, e. Harriman, the railroad uh, um, baron, uh, whose daughter had, at Columbia, um, Mary H R Rumsey Harriman was, no, Mary Averill Harriman, um, was not, her nickname was Eugenia because she so liked the idea of eugenics. She, she, wor she works for, for Davenport in the summers uh, and then introduces him to her mother. And uh, Mrs. Harriman, un you, know, you know, you don't know the name of a Harriman Foundation. It came later, there was one. But at the time that the Rockefellers and the Carnegies were doing foundations, she was writing checks out of her own bank account. She was the wealthiest woman in America. Uh, her husband's estate was settled entirely on her, and she was making these decisions. And one of her wishes, many of her, many of her beneficences were progressive, very much so, uh, but she made the decision uh, that she wanted to do what she could to up, hold up, uphold the American race, uh, I think is the phrase, and Davenport goes to her and she says, you've got the money, and he writes the letter home to, to his wife. This is a red letter day. Uh, and that becomes the phrase that keeps on popping up whenever he finds yet another uh, somebody to finance his rather um, loathsome adventures. Well, to get back to Madison Grant, I mean, and, and Scribner, I mean, so there's this going on in, you know, upper class Boston, upper class New York, um, and then obviously at least with what you show of Scribner, I mean, it also becomes a commercial venture. I mean, the same, you know, what, whatever is happening politically, uh, which obviously has economic uh, basis, um, there's also quite a bit of commercial success, I mean, that Scribner yeah. has in this kind of publishing. And so if you could tell us yeah, over I, several I, decades. I, I, I publish a list of about, a, well, there were, there were 19, I think I counted, uh, eugenic books, or, and many of them, specifically eugenics and immigration, published by Scribner between the original publication of Grant's book in 1916 and then the publication of Grant's last book in 1933, which is an important part of the story. Uh, when Charles Scribner, Princeton, uh, meets Henry Fairfield Osborne, Princeton, uh, at a Princeton-dominated event and learns about what Osborne's friend Grant has been writing, uh, he says, yeah, I'd like to publish this book. He gets the manuscript, and he drops it on the, on, on the desk of a 31-year-old editor who has just been moved up from the advertising department named Maxwell Perkins. This was a real shock. for the, Everybody here knows Maxwell Perkins, I think, but for those of us, I grew up in the book publishing business. I read books. I loved Fitzgerald, never liked Hemingway, but I do admire. Uh, you know, he was the great, the great editor in the history of American publishing. He was also the editor for Madison Grant in 1916, 1918, 1920, 1923. Uh, and he, after Grant has really totally discredited, and after the rise of the Nazis, he comes back to Scribner and, and uh, 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 Perkins publishes him again. And there are a couple letters that Perkins wrote. And, and I do believe that among the upper classes, the, the, what we would say the WASP upper classes, that in that period, anti-Semitism was normative. It would have been more surprising to find somebody who was you know, totally free uh, of anti-Semitism. They existed, of course. Um, but at, in 1933, Perkins is, is soothing Grant's feelings about the bad reviews he's getting, because by now he is known 
as a crank. And he says, it's because, Perkins says, it's because there's a race that controls the reviewing business here. Uh, your book will do much better, get better reviews in England because the Jews, quote, the Jews are not as powerful over there. I mean, this does not match up with anything we know about Maxwell Perkins. Now, there's a letter in today's Times by Scott Berg, the official, the, who wrote the prize-winning biography uh, of, of uh, Perkins, and he has a somewhat different view, shall I say, in his biography of Maxwell Perkins. He never mentions Madison Grant uh, or Lothrop Stoddard, an even more racist writer whom he enthusiastically published seven books with. Uh, there is, I guess, some dispute. Uh, there is one point that, that Berg makes that I think is plausible, that it's possible that per Perkins doesn't begin with Grant before the first edition of The Passing of Great Race, maybe it's the second edition. Um, but it's, I can't think of Maxwell Perkins in any other way now, nor will I ever. Nor will so, I ever. I yeah. mean, what, what I found astounding, and I, this, this research is so interesting, in the Scribner archive at Princeton. So I assume you didn't know about Maxwell Perkins no, when you I, sold the book. Well, no, I knew, I knew that I had read a biography of Grant, an academic biography, quite a good one, by a man named Jonathan Spiro, if you really want to know about Grant, I, I recommend the book highly. Um, I knew that Perkins had edited the one book. Um, that's all I knew. Uh, but I had not been in the letters. And you know, that, to do this kind of research, this is for me the joy of, of these books. The writing is a pain in the neck. The research is just as a constant thrill. You're getting into the lives of people in ways that you, you, know, you, can't, you, you can't imagine possible. They all saved their letters. I, I say in the acknowledgments, you know, th th I'm so grateful to their children who either didn't realize that they were saying racist things or didn't care that they were saying, they, these are not Baudelaireized uh, cl uh, collections of letters by any means. Uh, the Perkins letters, are, it's all there. It's, it's, you know, the, yes, we all, if we're book publishers, we all publish books that we don't ag agree with. But this is carrying it a little far. To be publishing Madison Grant in 1933 is really kind of hard to just say, oh, well, I publish all, view all viewpoints, well, and, which is what and Berg says. Yeah. The, the, the number of books, I mean, for, from these two authors, I mean, what I found more upsetting, really, than the letters, although that letter, which you quote you know, late in the book, is, is shocking because it's a, a, a glimpse of Perkins's own ideas, even if they were not, you know, sort of uh, Nazi ideas, uh, you know, that he was espousing, uh, that it was more the material you, you found, the promotional material that either he or others at Scribner wrote or the communication that they had internally about, about the book that, that seemed to be more upsetting about... Right. In, in 1932, there's a Scribner sales piece um, for Grant's book, 33, uh, I guess, no, it's a catalog that comes out in 32. It's a, uh, it's a letter to booksellers with the catalog that said that, uh, you know, every nation has its problems with people who are different. Hitler has his solution. Here's our solution. Now, this is long before even the Nuremberg Laws, but you didn't need to know a lot to know that Hitler was pretty bad news, and why are you using him to be the, you know, to, 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 to be almost the endorser the celebrity endorser of, right. of, of a Madison Grant book. It's, uh, we know, by the way, that, that Hitler read The Passing of the Great Race when he was in jail in the Landsberg prison after the, the Beer Hall Putsch in 1923-1924. He cited Grant many times in speeches in Mein Kampf. He, writes, he, he, he publishes a tribute to the Americans for their immigration laws because they understand the problem of, of corrupting the, the national bloodstream. Uh, and the last chapter of the book is really how the, about how the, not just the ideas of the American eugenicists, or scientific racists as they became known, uh, arrived in, in Germany, but they were developed alongside one another. The, the, the German race scientists uh, had been working with, not on racial issues necessarily, but had been working with the American eugenicists going back to 1905. Uh, and one of them is... Uh, actually celebrated in 1936, he's invited, in 1936, he's invited uh, to uh, Germany to get an honorary degree from the University of Heidelberg three months after the university had fired its entire Jewish faculty. Uh, this is after the Nuremberg Laws, and he wasn't able to go for complex reasons, but he, he was very happy to get this, this degree in 1936. He was honored for being the far-seeing uh, um, 
advocate for, for racial policies in the U.S. Well, and you quote to very chilling effect the a remark of the university spokesman at this celebration um, that in Germany we, and at this university, we no longer are you know, looking for truth for truth's sake or science for science's sake. It's really all in service of the regime service. and our policies. Exactly, exactly right. Uh, but he accepts his degree um, in the oh, very in, happily. I mean, th there in is America. He a, still a, gets the certificate. A, lo a lot of the geneticists, and particularly the institutions that supported them, they suddenly wake up, 1933, 1934, and 1935, and say, "Oh my God, look what we've done. We have been f putting forth theories that match what this madman is doing in Germany." And the Rockefeller Foundation get, gets it, it out of eugenics. The Carnegie Institution drops all of its research in, in, in eugenics. Any number of universities that have been involved in it, it's suddenly become a very hot, uh, 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 a scary item. And some people are just afraid of the backlash. Others really realize how horrible it is that they've done. And there are several uh, academic uh, uh, scientists who make public recantations and really they really do rip their, you know, the, the flay their own flesh in horror what they've made possible. Uh, Edward A. Ross, who was a leading sociologist, he's the man who's responsible for the tenure system in American universities in a peculiar way, because he was fired at Stanford for his left-wing political views in 1900, and the American Association of University Professors came out of that. He was Robert La Follette's very closest friend of the University of Wisconsin faculty, uh, and he wrote a book, he wrote, uh, vile things about the Europeans. He, he, he describes at one point uh, sitting in a bench in Union Square and seeing these people who look like, you know, they, they, they ox-like people who look like they belong in waddled huts in the Ice Age. And these are workers going home from their jobs in the, in, in, in the garment business. That man, 15 years later, was national chairman of the American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, he called himself a socialist. And in 1936, he writes uh, he, uh, an apology. Uh, I, in a memoir, he, I take it all back. I can't believe I did these horrible things. Some of them don't apologize. Uh, they go and accept honorary degrees. Well, um, you mentioned Hitler as a celebrity endorser. <laughs> I mean, what, uh, one of the astounding things, I mean, and you've hinted at this, is that really Hitler uses these scientists or writers as his own endorsers as he moves forward. And there was a, a wonderful letter that you quote, I mean, wonderful in terms of research, but not in terms of what it says, and I just I have to read it, that Madison Grant writes to Max Perkins in 1924, um, uh, around the, after the Beer Hall Putsch. Um, it seems strange that after a silence of about seven years, there should be this sudden excitement in Germany over my book. Yes, I mean, because just, Mein Kampf had yeah. just been published, and you know it's referenced. It's yeah. so horrific, yeah. Yeah, to, it's and really he seems really to be quite blind, not only to the long-term implications, but even to <laughs> the momentary. Well, I don't know whether Grant was blind to them. I mean, I think he rather liked them. He he was a supporter of Hitler's, absolutely, uh, to the end of, of, of Grant's life in 1937, yeah, definitely. Well, so the... That's the man who brought us the Bronx Zoo. Never forget that whenever you go to the Bronx Zoo. Well, you also uh, make it uh, clear that the man who gave us the SAT was also... <laughs> well, that's not as <laughs> nice as the Bronx Zoo. Right. We don't love the SAT. <laughs> uh, uh, Carl Brigham of Princeton, uh, who devised the SAT, also wrote the leading academic uh, analysis of, of intelligence tests that were given to 1.7 million American servicemen in World War I uh, that proves the... the, the uh, uh, deficiency of the Eastern and Southern European racial groups one by one by one by one. Uh, in 1930, pre-Hitler and unbidden, he publishes an apology. Uh, he, he rips his shirt open. He said he can't believe he did it. I rue that day. Uh, of All the bad studies, all the horrible studies that were published, uh, none was worse than the one by this author, he says. So as you were working on this book, I mean, immigration, as you prove has been a, an issue for several hundred years in in North America. And one of the other amazing things is you have a footnote. The footnotes must not be missed in this book. I mean, it's worth reading for the footnotes alone, although the, the text is pretty fantastic also. But that um, Boston Brahmins 
used the, the, the term Native Americans. They call themselves Native Americans. Uh, yeah. They saw that those who had come over uh, uh, in the 16th, from the time of the Pilgrims and shortly thereafter were the Native Americans because the Red Man, as they called him, didn't exist. You know, somebody once said that Henry Cab Cabot Lodge's idea of the West was Pittsfield. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that uh, as you were working on this, I mean, although, as I said, immigration has always been an issue, uh, when did you begin working on this and when did you finish it and how did it intersect in your mind with politics, I mean, even until this moment of over-immigration? Uh, well, I've never been happier to be in a year and a half late with a book because <laughs> I really, I, I caught the moment, I think. Um, I began working on the book in January of 1914, uh, <laughs> it, it feels like I began working on the book in January of 2014, and uh, I have to say, it wasn't fun. Uh, I, I've been living with these people in my head for five years. Uh, my wife and my daughter who are here, and my dear friends who are here, they've been, you know, watching me moan and bitch and whine about the, why did I write this horrible book about these horrible people? Uh, it's been very, very difficult, and I don't think I'll ever be able to purge them uh, from my consciousness. Um, was I writing about the current moment? No. When I published my history of prohibition, um, the first question in every meeting was, well, what about marijuana? Uh, how does it relate? And I didn't mention marijuana at all in the book. And so far, maybe not tonight, the first question in <clears throat> when I talk about this book is how does it relate to the immigration situation today, uh, which I do not address at all for the same reason, which is to say it's so obvious. It's so obvious in so many ways. Show some respect for the reader. Let the reader discover that. Well, and in fact, I actually thought that not only was it you know, sort of in, in a way a commentary, inevitably, as history always is on the present, but, but that longer history of resistance to immigration, even at the founding of the nation, seemed more important as a century, you know, histories of several centuries rather than just, well, what can, you know, the, 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 these laws of the early 20th century that survived until... Until 1965, the, the quota law of 1924, which uh, really was designed to pick country by country by country, though they did not mention a single country or a single ethnic group in the legislation. It was really brilliant. Uh, it reduced the number of Italians coming into the U.S. from 220,000 a year to fewer than 4,000 a year. The number of Eastern European Jews from somewhere between 60 and 90,000 a year to 7,000 a year. We know what happened to the ones who didn't come. Uh, we know about the horrible, grim system of peonage in southern Italy that people continue to suffer through. The, we know about the quarter of a million uh, Serbs who were murdered by the Nazis, the 350,000 Greeks who starved. How many of these people wanted to come, would have come? But this law stayed in place until 1965. Uh, and it really did shape the nature uh, of, of the country. And one, one of the, you know, one's always looking for a happy ending. Uh, the happy ending in this book was one that 1965 they changed the law so that it was no longer uh, ethnicity or, ri or race based. But the other thing that was a happy ending is I realized that everything that these guys feared came true. They were right from their own perspective. Their kids did marry Jews and Italians. They don't get into Harvard automatically anymore. They don't run the country anymore. All the things that they say in their, in their, their own words in 1910, 1920, that they fear is going to happen, it happened anyway. And that was a happy ending. Well, <laughs> well let's cut it off there and go to questions from the audience and uh, keep it at the happy ending. Uh, so thank you, Dan, for a, a, a magnificent book and a wonderful evening. Um, we will now have questions from the audience, and there'll be a microphone coming around. So um, I guess uh, you. Um, yes, thanks. I'm just wondering if uh, Sir Cyril Burke, the founder of Mensa, who was a big push of IQ tests, uh, figures in this at all. I and mean, when I was an undergraduate, there was a, a big 
well, I don't know if I want to call it a debate because it was pseudoscience on one side, these guys claiming uh, proof of heritability of IQ. And as I recall, uh, their quote unquote evidence was um, uh, a lot of statistics that Bird had, had collected from uh, separated and twins, which was eventually. And had faked. Bogus, uh, yeah, yes, yeah, it was yeah. fake. So anyway, I'm just curious whether you. No, no Bert, Bert is one of those many people who hit the cutting room floor when I was trying to get the book down to manageable size. He's a little bit late for my story, and he's British, uh, so he didn't qualify as much. But you know, you, you, every writer says this, oh, I could write another book out of the stuff that didn't make it into this book. Don't worry, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Oh, Miss? If Darwin opened the door to the gents movement, does Lamarck figure into this at all? Another one who didn't stay in the book. <laughs> I, had, I had this chapter on, on Lamarck, Lamarckian uh, view of heredity, um, and then re leading uh, to the story of, uh, of Weismann, uh, um, the great Austrian biologist, and I gave the manuscript to a historian of science and said, you know, you're showing off. And you really don't know your science all that well, so maybe I'll get it out, out of it. But the, I just, because you gave me the opening about Weismann, uh, he sought to disprove Lamarck. Lamarck said that you can inherit acquired characteristics. Uh, that, you know, if I really listen to a lot of Beethoven, my kid will be born a Beethoven lover. That's obviously reductionist, uh, uh, radically reductionist uh, version of it. Weismann sought to disprove the idea by cutting off the tail of 70 generations of <clears throat> of uh, 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 la laboratory mice. And no matter how much he cut off the tail, every one of them, the, the, the next generation, had tails. You know, so the, the, the alteration that was going on didn't make any difference. And one of the things that set him off on this path was, he pointed out, though not Jewish himself, he said, Jewish men have been circumcised for 5,000 years, <laughs> yet they still have foreskins when they're born. <laughs> That, I'm really cheapening Weissman to reduce it to that. He was a very important scientist. I think you should figure out a way to get that story into the next iteration of your old Jews telling jokes <laughs> show. So let nothing go to waste. Okay. <laughs> Questions from this side? Wow. <laughs> You mentioned Gompers also in favor of uh, limiting immigration from Eastern and Southern European peoples. Could you explain why Gompers' reasoning was? Wages. <clears throat> in fact, the, the Eastern and Southern Europeans who were brought here, as many were, some uh, under a form of contract labor, which was really indentured servitude, but others under this uh, law that was passed under Lincoln, which encouraged the immigration of working people. Um, the more that came, the lower the wage of the American uh, working man was. Um, you know, uh, Jim Hill, the railroad baron, he said, why would I hire an American? I can hire six Chinese for the same amount of money. That's what led to the, the 1882 Chinese uh, Restriction Act, Protection Act. Um, I just wanted to mention, and uh, I don't know if you talk about it in the book, obviously. I haven't gotten the book yet. Um, You'll have your chance. <laughs> I will <laughs> take it. 1923, the role of Jews in all of this and how they're at fault. 1923, Emmanuel Seller was a freshman member of Congress when the immigration bill was passed. 1965, he was chair of the Judiciary Committee and passed the liberalization. <laughs> Yes, it was, that was a, the kind of wonderful thing that you don't expect to find, that uh, when the uh, restriction law is passed in, in, in 1924, the only member of the House Immigration Committee to vote against it was freshman Representative Emanuel Seller of Brooklyn. And the bill uh, that ushered out the quota system was the Hart-Seller Act, and Seller was there for the signing. And then Liz Holtzman came along and knocked him out of the picture. <laughs> yeah. we, oh. We're used to a kind of, oh, thank you. 
we're used to a kind of heroic narrative of the Scopes monkey trial as kind of, you know, enlightenment and science against uh, superstitious darkness and so on. But I wonder, does your research slightly recast that narrative a little bit? Is there a sense in which Scopes is a little bit of a bad guy in this story? Uh, no, I don't think Scopes was a bad guy. Um, the, the presence of eugenics in the book, uh, w it was there because that was the science of the moment. That was accepted science. The number of people in the scientific establishment who resisted it, there were some, the key person being the great anthropologist Franz Boas, uh, who plays a major role in the book, um, but it was part of the modern world. And people like Osborne, great paleontologist, he's the one who named Tyrannosaurus Rex, he, he really he discovered bones all over the world. And, he, and well, I was going to say he wrote some important books, but his staff wrote some really important books for him uh, uh, through his career. No, he was Scopes' biggest backer, and he was also Madison Grant's best friend and equivalent uh, scientific racist. Uh, there wasn't a contradiction. This is science. So there weren't biology textbooks that were espousing other ideas. I mean, that's what Scopes had to work with. Well, there were those that did not discuss evolution. You know, the, the, oh. well, the, that, was, that was the issue for him. Uh, but George Hunter of DeWitt Clinton High School made it possible for well, and say a little bit more about, about Boaz. I mean, that's a, a very, because he uh, was, was Jewish, I mean, but he also was friends with Davenport. So, I mean, it's not as if he, I mean, he might not have agreed with his theories, and yet he was able to maintain very cordial uh, relations. Da da Davenport is an incredibly complicated figure, and I would do him serious injustice to try to explain him. Um, and I'm still thinking, I'm still trying to explain him to myself. He was the tribune of eugenics in America. Uh, he did say some pretty horrible things. He said one thing that was really useful for those of us who write about this stuff. He said in a letter to Madison Grant in 1920, can we build a wall high enough to keep these people out? Uh, they could, and they did. Um, but uh, he maintained really good relations with Boas. Boas in 1924, wants to leave his papers to, into Davenport's care. Uh, Davenport is very active in, in helping uh, German Jewish and, and Austrian Jew Jewish uh, scientists escape from Hitler. Uh, and he was totally oblivious to his role in this. He, he did not see the consequences of his own actions, his own views. He, he, he was a zealot. He found eugenics, and he thought it was the solution to everything. Uh, he made his fundamental scientific mistake is so s obvious. Uh, you know, the, Mendel determined that the color of a, a pea plant, the flower on a pea plant, would either be white or pink depending on one recessive gene matching up with another recessive gene, a unit characteristic. Uh, humans do have a few. Color blindness is a is a, uh, a unit characteristic, but we are much more complex than pea plants. He didn't see it. He said, "Well, if you take." One person who has, uh, um, who likes hunting and marries another person like hunting, their kids will like hunting. I mean, it's so ridiculous. <laughs> he wrote a book about, about what he called philosophilia, love of the sea, and he thought it was genetic that people went to the sea and joined the Navy or became fishermen. He never stopped to think that, well, because dad was in the Navy and dad was a fisherman and I'm living on a goddamn coast, what else am I going to do for a living? The, the, the split between nature and nurture, he just never saw it. And this was a really important scientist. Boas stayed friendly with him uh, to the end of Boas's life, which was itself a, quite a moment. Um, he was sitting in his chair at, at Columbia discussing eugenics and he killed over and died in mid-sentence uh, in 1942. So a couple of more questions. Um, yes. Um, Margaret Sanger has often been characterized as a eugenicist. Had you touched on that in your book? Yes, I do. And it, it, that is another one that's complex, but I'll do the best job I can with it. <clears throat> uh, first, if you stop to think about it, what Sanger believed in birth control, which she you know, names it birth control, her campaign, her absolutely essential campaign, was a form of planned reproduction. It had that in common with the eugenic idea, that you know we can't just leave this to the chance of people finding each other and choosing to have babies, that there has to be some control over it. That's point number one. Point number two, Sanger, Sanger made some incredibly unappealing alliances with some incredibly unappealing people. 
She was like many zealots who, if you find somebody who agrees with you, you stop thinking about the things that you disagree with that person about. And I took care to quote Sanger as late as her autobiography published in 1938, saying some you know, very much pro-eugenic things. Uh, I don't think it can be denied. Now, th denied. The, the number one charge against Sanger uh, that is made about how she wanted to uh, eliminate black people in the South is totally specious. It's a, a corruption of a letter that she wrote in which the people who have used that took out the middle two sentences and changes the meaning entirely. But she was sympathetic to the eugenics movement. She was uh, in correspondence with Grant. She invited Grant to come and speak at one of her conferences. Uh, and you know, we can't be happy about it, but we can't deny it. Uh, Although some people do. The, the, the story of the quote is another wonderful footnote in the book. Um, uh, this will be our last question, and then you can ask questions at the reception upstairs after after this. Sorry to hold you off for a second. We'll have a reception upstairs on the main floor where Dan will uh, do a book signing, and you can ask him as many questions as you'd like. Okay, well, uh, let me just say that I actually have read the book and loved it. Oh, and we don't want an intelligent you all question to, to end. Buy it. <laughs> My question is, if the Nazis hadn't come along and, and sh prove the consequence of eugenics. Would, do you think that the science, I mean, did, did Nazism and Hitler um, spell the end of eugenics? And if it were not for them, would, would we still be, would, would it still have had some legitimacy as a science? Obviously, we can never know. Um, <clears throat> this, science would have caught up. Science did catch up. Uh, there were very uh, 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 accomplished geneticists doing really important work. Some of them trained by and working with Davenport, Thomas Hunt Morgan, the man who kind of invented the fruit fly. Uh, but you know, Nobel Prize winners who were really critically important in finally understanding genetics and leading up to the discovery of DNA. And we won't talk about James Watson here because that's a whole kettle of fish that I can't, can't get into. Uh, but, but the science would have caught up with it. Uh, would science have triumphed immediately? No way of knowing. But I would say that knowing the pace of the development of genetic science, I would say that certainly you know, by, by the mid-40s, the eugenicists would have been exposed as frauds. But I mean, given given the link that you draw between science and politics in this book, has science triumphed? I mean, it doesn't seem to me that w in an era that you know where people are still talking about the bell curve and other, I mean, you know, James Watson, without going into him, you know that that science may not have triumphed. Certainly not in the political realm. Well, there's no unanimity on anything. Uh, so I, I think that w we can fairly say in genetics that the the prevailing view is is the the, the DNA view, the human genome. That kind of you know uh, puts a lot of the other stuff to, uh, uh, to, to shame. Um, but we'll always have people who will come forward with their theories. We will always have them, and they will seem attractive. Uh, and a certain part of the population will follow uh, the Pied Piper, and we hope that we can get most of the population to march in the other direction. Well, on that note, we will <laughs> thank you, Dan Okren. That you. was. And we'll go upstairs in that direction.